Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. We focus on a totally different lesson that I'll read to you now from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It does connect with that other second lesson we read, so we end up with a larger chunk of that same section. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, dear fellow believers, where does all the attention go these days? I don't really need to tell you, but it's the latest on the Trump impeachment trial. It's the latest on the pandemic statistics. It's the latest on the economy. The latest on the job numbers from the front lines to the airlines to the pipelines. Our 24-7 news cycle just keeps on feeding us headline after headline after headline of all the newest and latest things. All kinds of attention grabbers that jump into our spotlight so the spotlight of our attention focuses on them. Today, the spotlight focuses on something completely different. Something that doesn't just pop into the news cycle and then disappear, or float around for a few months and then fade. The spotlight highlights something that lasts. True, lasting glory and true, lasting joy and peace. Something that doesn't fade. Peter, James, and John were sleepy, it says, but not for long. When Jesus brought them up on that mountain, he grabbed their full attention. There was Moses, there was Elijah, those pillars of the Old Testament standing there with Jesus. These were like prophets from the prophet hall of fame. They were right there, and yet that was nothing compared to Jesus himself. Jesus himself with his clothes looking like they were on fire, glowing brighter than the sun, dazzling with splendor and brilliance. The cloud, the voice from heaven, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. It was a showstopper, it was a huge attention grabber, all focused on Jesus. Today that spotlight continues to shine on Jesus and his gospel. Jesus grabs our attention today on Transfiguration Sunday and focuses it squarely on himself. Jesus grabs our attention today and focuses our attention on his gospel. Our gospel, or Jesus' ministry of the gospel, may not look like it's much of an attention grabber. In this world of high-tech special effects and ultra-high definition, and constant 24-7 news cycle that brings us things almost instantaneously, the gospel doesn't even seem like it can compete. That spotlight shining with all the glory of God's own sun on the mountain no longer shines for the eyes to see. But as we see from Paul's words in 2 Corinthians, the gospel does shine with lasting glory. This all happened so long ago that the attention by now has faded. There's no crowd of people gathered around watching. But at the time, at Mount Sinai, this was a showstopper. This was a huge attention grabber. Moses, walking down from the mountain, holding the two tablets of stone, 
inscribed with the finger of God, bearing the very words of God to give to the people. The fire of God was burning. The thunder of God was rolling. The voice of God was sounding. The glory of God was there hidden in the cloud. The glory was so tremendous and overwhelming that Moses had to wear a veil so that people couldn't directly see his face. The glory of God reflected in him. It was so glorious they could hardly stand it. And yet, no matter how glorious that was, it was nothing compared to the glory of Jesus. Nothing compared to the glory of the new message, the new covenant, the new messenger, the new ministry. If that message was glorious, then this another message, this new message and this new messenger and this new ministry has surpassing glory. Paul grabs the attention of the Corinthian Christians and compares these two messages, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the ministry of the letter and the ministry of the Spirit. We would say the law and the gospel. John writes in his gospel, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Look at these two messages and these two messengers, Paul says. There's Moses bringing the law. There's Jesus bringing the gospel of grace and truth. And he says, compare them side by side. If Moses was glorious, if God's law being presented with, written with his finger inscribed in the stone, prescribing for his people what they must do and what they must not do, If that was glorious, can you even imagine how glorious it is when Jesus arrives with grace and truth and forgiveness and salvation? That's glory that lasts. Paul grabs our attention too and focuses it on this gospel ministry. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. So the letter and the Spirit, two different messages, two different messengers, two different ministries. The letter, it's talking about the law. Maybe you've heard the expression, the letter of the law, because you're being very precise about what the law says. The law is the kind of message that needs to be written down. It has a point and then a subpoint and a clause, and a subclause, and, a, and another detail. Do this, do that. In this situation, avoid that. And in the event of this, react like this. In the event of a breach, or a break, or a violation here, this is the result and consequence. Try fitting all of that on a birthday cake. Way too complicated. Try reading that out loud to someone, and have them explain it back, and say, yeah, I got that. The law is meant to be detailed and clear, so it needs to be written down. But the gospel? The gospel is meant to be shouted from the rooftops. The gospel is meant to be spoken from person to person and transmitted and shared. Yeah, the gospel's written down too. Yeah, it's clear and precise and unchanging, given by God in the Bible. But think about how the gospel, the the message, the ministry of the Spirit is a different kind of message. It is the kind of message that you can write with a frosting gun on a birthday cake. Happy birthday! Or I love you cake. Or congratulations. Or welcome home. Just a short, simple message without lots of fine print and complicated legal jargon. But just a message that just by speaking it delivers all the blessings and gifts. You can put it on a banner. We won the game, or we won the war. You can speak to a prisoner and say, you're free. And he doesn't need to read long pages after pages of fine print and legal language. It's just done. By hearing it, it happens. Forgiveness, joy, peace announced in the message, in the ministry of the Spirit. Paul says these two ministries, these two messages have a different effect, too, on their hearers. He says, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
the law brings condemnation to sinners because we all sinners have broken the law. So this fine print of God's law contains no promises, no give, no mercy, no compassion, but only commands and demands and consequences and punishments. And so it condemns sinners and threatens us with eternal death and hell. It kills. But the gospel, the message of the Spirit through Jesus, delivers life. It takes sinners and makes them perfect in the sight of God. He, like he says, it gives righteousness, not condemnation. It says that sinners have been declared righteous in the sight of God because of what Jesus did. And so gives life to them. The life of faith. The life of hope. The life of joy. The life of peace. And the life that lasts in eternity. So Paul says again, look at these two messages. If that old message was glorious because it came from God, the message that condemns and spells out the commands and demands and consequences of sin, if that was glorious, think of how much more glorious, surpassingly glorious, the ministry of the gospel is. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Paul again compares the two and says, that old glory of Moses and the revelation of the law and the commands of God, as glorious as that was, it's as if it's nothing at all. What was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory of Jesus bringing grace and truth, shining as the Son of God, bringing salvation, forgiveness, justification for sinners. If what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? The law of Moses was for the Old Testament people. From that point to that point, and his glory faded. And that old covenant no longer applies to the people of God. Though, of course, the Ten Commandments are universal. But all of that was transitory, fading. The gospel lasts forever. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, brings promises that never end. Love of God that is from everlasting to everlasting. Life with God that goes on eternally. And so the gospel, through Jesus, from Jesus, about Jesus, shines with lasting glory. In our world today, it doesn't really seem like that gospel can compete because we've got high-tech special effects and we've got stereo surround sound and we have Photoshop and we have all kinds of different things that are particularly designed and engineered to grab and hold people's attention. You have the 24-7 news cycle that delivers things almost instantaneously. You have things like Netflix and Crave TV and Disney Plus and the whole host of other entertainment options constantly feeding us more things for our attention. You have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest with little tidbits of attention grabbers fed up in a constant stream. Meanwhile, the gospel has no neon lettering. It has no bright, shining sparkle to it. It has no big click here arrow. It has no stereo surround sound or impressive special effects when we read it out of the Bible or hear it proclaimed. In our own faulty human judgment, in our presumption, we might even try and give God advice and say, next time, maybe you might want to work on your delivery. But of course, there's nothing wrong with God's delivery, is there? And the, the problem is not with God's gospel delivery system. And the problem is not really either with the Netflix and the Facebook and the news cycle and internet and TV and, and all of that, there's nothing inherently sinful about any of those things. And in fact, that we see entertainment as a good gift and blessing from God 
especially at a time when we have time on our hands to fill. No, the problem is with us. The problem is that our sinful nature automatically gives its attention to the wrong things. We have our attention automatically gravitating toward the things that God says are not helpful, toward things that have no lasting value. Our attention naturally goes toward the things that have a flash and then fade, appear briefly and then disappear, things that have significance in the moment but not of lasting value. Our sinful nature is drawn to the things God says are offensive to him and harmful to us. And yet our sinful nature keeps on craving those things, looking to those things, and feeding its attention on those things. If all we had was the fine print legal code of God's law, then we would sit in the blinding, glaring spotlight of God's condemnation without hope. But the ministry of the Spirit, the coming of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus shines the spotlight not on us and our sin, but on Jesus, our Savior. It shines the spotlight on the one who came as a man, born in Bethlehem, our own flesh and blood, raised in Nazareth, walking through that holy land, preaching, teaching, healing, forgiving. The gospel highlights Jesus, who is not just an ordinary human being, though he is like us in every way, but as the one true, powerful, majestic, eternal Son of God, God and man in one person, God in the flesh, our Savior who came down from heaven to rescue us and save us. The gospel highlights Jesus who perfectly kept every one of God's laws, the points and the subpoints and the clauses and the subclauses, and defied all of the consequences because he kept it perfectly for us. The gospel highlights and draws our attention to Jesus, the Savior, who paid for our sins on the cross and washed us clean of every spot and stain. Through Jesus, through the gospel, the Holy Spirit declares to us, not with fine print or technical jargon, but with plain language and bold, bright lettering, something to be shouted from the rooftops, look at Jesus. He's your Savior. He's God's Son who came for you. He died for your sins. He rose again, and because he lives, you also will live. Don't be afraid to look God in the face because you are his dear child. You are free. You are forgiven. You will live in glory with this glorious Son of God. What a glorious, glorious message. Now, all of our earthly lives, we might continue to struggle with where our attention belongs. Like the Apostle Paul struggled too, he said, even who I am, he said, I, I struggle. He said, the things I want to focus on, I don't focus on. And the things I want to get rid of my life forever, that's the things I keep on being drawn to. But he also said, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's forgiveness through faith. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, who's been living in us since our baptism and working in us by the power of the gospel, we are able to keep refocusing the spotlight of our attention squarely on our Savior. We have that opportunity now coming up in the season of Lent to refocus, to reset, to recenter our spotlight, our attention on the Savior, on his love, on his suffering and death on our behalf, on his cross, on his gracious gifts, on the blessing of eternal life that flows through him to us. Sometimes Lent is made out to be a season of, of less. We want to try and do less of this or less of that. And there's been lots of different things invented or, or put forward that people should do less of for themselves. That's entirely your choice. You might find that you want to do less of something. God hasn't made any rules about that. And I'm certainly not going to of what your Lent should look like. But maybe it would be helpful to think of it the other way. Less of something, sure. But more. What if we focus more attention on Jesus? More Jesus. More gospel. More ministry of the Spirit. More encouragement. More lasting hope that comes through Jesus and his cross and his empty tomb. 
more powerful, glorious gospel that delivers to us lasting blessing, lasting joy, lasting hope and strength. This ministry of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus, just like on that mountain, though we can't see it with our eyes, shines with lasting glory. And so will you. Amen.